choices uh, on how many plants are optioned for you. There's a lot of choices. I just picked some of my favorites that are companion plants that go together uh, in the landscape. Okay, some obvious choices. These are some that you'll actually go through your neighborhood and go, oh, I, I know that one. Oh yeah, can talk about that one. Oh, I, I know that one. That, you will be, by the time we get done, you'll be able to identify a lot of these, okay? Not all of them, because the desert willows, which is the number one seller, they're still ugly. I don't want to bring a twig up here, because it's going to be a month out before it actually leaves out. It's two months before it starts to bloom. And that's a, a little tree about, I don't know, 15 feet tall, kind of rounded shape, or sometimes it's multi-stem. You'll see it growing wild. You'll see a tree, like a really large bush or short tree, going out Dewey, Humboldt, Mayer, down towards Kirkland, Skull Valley, uh, hillside, this wild tree just growing on the side of the road, and it's got these beautiful blooms. That's a desert willow. It does really, really well here. Uh, but I don't want to show off my ugliest stuff, because they're not leafing, they're not blooming, they're not doing anything right now. So I'll just mention it. You go ask for it later. What I brought are the things that are looking pretty good right now, and we'll show off those things, okay? Now, as you're designing your landscapes, you kind of do want four seasons. And let me just tell you how to break that down as you're designing. This is really important for you Californians. Now, not everyone here is a Californian. How many new people do we have in the room? Brand is, you knew it, okay? I'm not going to ask how many are California, but I'm going to tell you only half of you. The other half are from all over the planet, well represented in the Midwest. Uh, Alaskans, any Alaskans here? Not this time. It seems like Alaska and Hawaii. I don't know where you all are coming from, but those two are showing up all of a sudden. They haven't been on the radar in the past. So from everywhere else. So I think Californians get a bad rap uh, just, just because, I don't know why, just because. We need, we need a scapegoat. Uh, I've got a kid that was born in California. I made my start in California. I was up in Roseville, uh, Folsom, <coughs> Sacramento area. I was a credit bureau. I created credit bureaus out of college. I was a corporate banker. Oh, I hate to actually admit that. Uh, I set up credit bureaus and I tracked how you paid your bills. And then I sold that data back to the credit unions, banks, car dealerships to see if you're going to get a loan or not. And so I made good money with that. I just missed my small town and I wanted to come back home. And so corporate's always moving you. It's kind of like the army or something. It's always moving you to another city every couple of years. And I was tired of my moves and I said, I want to come back home. And I wanted that influence from grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins. So I was looking for that. And so we're a very large family here in town. And so we found a way to come back into the family business. And that's how Ken and Lisa Lane come to own Waters Garden Center. Her father is Harold Waters, the founder of the company. So that's just kind of how all those connections kind of work. Um, let's start with how to plant. Get that out of the way. Um, most of you are in very heavy clay soils. The soil does not perk. It doesn't drain. And if you dig a hole, um, I would say test it before you plant any of these plants. If you get too much water on any of these, they will die like that within three weeks, dead. Um, and it's just purely from overwatering. So what I tell folks is dig the hole, fill it up in the morning. If you've got water still sitting in that hole at the end of the day, you did not dig a planting hole, you dug a bathtub. Might as well expand it, just add some suds and soap and just enjoy the mud bath. Uh, it's got to perk. These things have to drain. And if you're going to kill them, it's going to be from overwatering. Also, don't listen to Phoenix. Phoenix is your curse. There are, that's where all the media comes from, all the guard, the big time guard guys, these guys are national celebrities. They're down in Phoenix and they're broadcasting, influencing us, and they're idiots when it comes to mountain gardening. They are going to kill your plants for you. I'm tired of people struggling with this. What they'll tell you is, oh, you want to plant in a divot, you want to plant the holes, we want a rain harvest for our plants. I feel awkward here. It's like, like you folks, you're in the suck zone right here. I'm trying to help you a little bit, but I feel, I feel your pain. Maybe I could do this at the very least, but these things out of the way. Um, so do not plant in a hole. Do not. This should be soil level on any of these plants we talk about. Do not bury this at all. 
and do not let this be below your current level of your landscape. Have it be at level or even better for most of you, a little above level and then mound the soil up above that. Man, in my youth, this didn't used to get heavy. All of a sudden, this thing's like, <laughs> gosh. It was just watered, of course, too. So do not put in a divot. Divot, what will happen is, down in Phoenix, I mean, why anyone lives 10 miles from the sun, I don't know. It's 110 <laughs> degrees out at midnight. It's ridiculous. <laughs> they should all move up to God's country. No, <laughs> they should not do that. <laughs> anyway, uh, down there it's hot. They'll tell you to water in the evening because it's more efficient with the water. Don't do that. You should plant things in a divot so it collects water. Don't do that. That works down there in the flatlands of Arizona. But up here in God's country, that is going to kill your plants. And here's why. You've got soil that doesn't perk very well anyway. It doesn't, doesn't drain very well anyway. And so you're going to put your emitters on. You put it on a drip, a drip system. And uh, you're going to water once a week. And they're going to be happy. And all will be well, but then the rains come in July, and you're on that cruise for three weeks through the Panama or wherever, and it rains in the afternoon, you're still watering once a week, and now you've got two afternoon rains from monsoons, and now that divot fills up with water. And all of a sudden, you get root rot or crown rot. Be very careful. We get, we get to all of our rain at once. Basically, there's two cycles, March and July. August, August, September. There's there's a rain cycle and there's a spring cycle. And so it's very wet in those two months. That's when you'll kill these plants. They'll be fine through the heat of June. 95, 100, no worries. Uh, once a week water, great, love it. If you forget to, to water once or twice, they're even happier. Uh, it's gonna be when the wet cycles happen. It'll be that snow in March. You know, I don't know, we had five foot drifts off the off the roof line was ridiculous. Um, I hated that. That's, I hope you never see that again. But anyway, I'll stop whining. Um, you had that much moisture. That sat there and just permeated, just saturated that soil for a month, just sitting there, root rotting. So these plants, a lot of these plants would die in that. So if you've got losses in your landscape, it's probably not from the snow. They don't care about the snow. It was because it was so wet, so long. It wasn't that cold. It wasn't sub-zero or even single digits. It was just the snow. Snow is not cold. It's just wet and sticky and gooey. And if your soil doesn't perk well, it's going to drown. So the secret is, let's dig a hole. We'll show you how to do that in a second. And make sure that it drains. So fill it up in the morning. Make sure it's drained by the end of the day. If not, uh, if we're out planting for you, uh, we've got a 35-pound jackhammer and a 70-pound, the big boy. We're talking like a heavy, I hate, I hate dealing with that piece of equipment. It's just so heavy. We'll try to take that fracture, the bottom of the hole. We won't try to dig out the whole thing. Sometimes we hit a caliche layer. Some of you out that 69 corridor, you've got this uh, gray calcium layer. They call it caliche. Um, I think the Native Americans called it like cement in the soil, I think is how you interpret that. It's terrible stuff. Water hits that, that calcium layer and it won't permeate it. It just won't go through and so there's no drainage. So we'll try to fracture that. We'll take a digging bar or a jackhammer and try to fracture that so the water will now seep through. Once you crack that up, the water now drains. And it's a game changer for your plants. In Prescott Valley, my first house, I uh, was in Prescott Valley, dating myself a little bit, this early 90s, and uh, Prescott Valley was still dirt roads, believe it or not. There were no services. I mean, you had a septic tank in the back. There was no city sewer. Nothing was out there. They ran a power line to you. That was it. Other than that, you're on your own. Uh, and I tried, I learned how to garden out there. Heavy clay, I mean, heavy clay, caliche layers is what we're talking about. And I was killing all of my, all of my evergreens, like... Where'd my Arizona Cypress go? Man, I killed more of these, it was ridiculous. I killed a lot of these out in Prescott Valley. Arizona Cypress, grows wild out to Prescott Val out to, uh, Skull Valley. That, that side of the hill over there, a lot of those are not junipers, they're Arizona Cypress. And the way you can tell, because they look the same, 
A juniper will put on a berry. An Arizona cypress puts on a little tiny pine cone. That's the only way I can really truly tell right away. This grows up to be about 20 feet tall, 12 foot wide, solid thick. I know it looks innocent, but uh, uh, small dogs, children have been lost in, in Arizona cypress. And it's thick. I mean, we use them for windbreaks, uh, privacy screens, uh, where that car, you're at the end of the street where the cars are always coming at you, you want to block the headlights, that kind of stuff. That's what we use that for, dust abatement. We use it that way. It is a native. Once you get it up to size, you can cut it off a wall care. It will go all by itself. No need for you ever again. Um, in heavy clay soil, though, I planted this at level. It, I took my own advice, but still I killed them. And so what I had to do with this is I had to plant it on a very slight mound. So I left probably three, four inches of, of root out of the ground. And then I slowly, I put a slight gentle slope on it so no one could see the hill, only I could. And I put my drip emitter on top of that, or you put your water basin around that. And that was a game changer. The mortality rate just dropped and things started thriving. Simply because I could allow the roots to breathe during the wet cycles. It's sort of like leaving your nose up out of a pool. When it's really wet, they can just breathe a little bit. They'll go. They want to live. They do not want to die. Uh, but if they're just sitting there drowning, they'll, they'll, they'll actually get root rot. You can actually pull the roots out of the ground. You actually see, you see these real white, fine root hairs? That's a healthy root. That's a, this is like the perfect root ball for, for a tree. Um, when they sit in water, these will turn black and stained. They look like mocha colored, and they'll actually have an odor. It'll smell like rotting, like rotting compost. That's root rot. It's a very, very common for any of these plants we're going to talk about. Yes? Yeah. Okay, good question. Let's just start with, we will cover that. Let's do that. Let's go how to plant. Um, when you're digging your hole, let's just plant this one. When you're planting this, the roots do not go down. That's a myth. There is no tap root. There's nothing that goes straight down. There's nothing for them to go down to. There's no water, there's no food, there's nothing but rocks, caliche, clay, and more yuck. So what natives do, even really large natives, they'll go down maybe two, three feet at most. Huge junipers, huge cottonwoods, huge native native trees. They'll go down about two, three feet, then they start going sideways, just like this. And roots will be all over the place. And their thinking is, it's not gonna rain very often, but when it does, I want as many surface roots as I can so I can pick up as much water as I can all at once. They're thinking, they're working with the environment, if you know that's how they're going to start growing, just, just provide a hole for them. So we encourage you to, to dig a hole three times as wide. So put a bucket on this side, a bucket on this side, make it round. So this would be about this big around hole, but only the same depth. You don't want to go deep. Much easier to dig a wide hole than a deep hole. Some of you poor contractors, you've got this back up. I've seen guys this far. In a hole this deep, there may, I, I think if it collapses, they would die. And I go, what are you doing down there? Get out of that. The plant does not need that. Uh, but they had the equipment and the time, I don't know. Just go shallow and go wide. The roots are going to go here. They're not going to go down there. Unless you hit a, a caliche layer or something that's just not it's causing an issue, then we, we don't dig the whole thing out. We just dig a chimney, a little piece of it just until we get to the next band of soil, and then all of a sudden it, it, it drains for you, okay? Now, some of you have are do, some of you just have rocks. Some of you are gonna hit a boulder, you dig a hole, and by the time you get done, the whole thing is just one great, great big rock and you're lucky to get out of the hole. Uh, you need to screen, screen that soil, screen it. Uh, get rid of anything that's bigger than a golf ball, okay? All those, anything bigger than that, the particles are too big, the water molecules can't, the surface is too large, and it's just, it's gonna heat up and bake the roots in the summer. So you want smaller particles and get more water molecules in that soil so it can retain that moisture, okay? So that's, that's important. It'll also allow the roots to get out and go into the surrounding soil. That, um, a lot of you, these new homes, there's no topsoil. There's not one living thing in your yard. I mean, all the topsoil was scraped off. And they started out with get rid of all living life. 
so that we can put down footers and patios and driveways. And, and so some of you, you'll put a plant in the ground, and if you don't amend it right, it'll just sit there. It won't grow. It just sit for years. This same plant will be in five years the same size. It doesn't die, but it doesn't grow. That's because the soil is dead. So you need to reinvigorate the soil. Plants need worms. They need mycorrhizal fungi. They need beneficials. There's some things that tickle the feet of plants where they kind of go, oh, the soil's alive. Oh, I, I should root here. This looks like it's good to grow. Soil is where it's all at. And most of us, in newer homes especially, the soil's dead. There's no way for you to replace all the topsoil in your yard. It's just not even practical. But you can do it hole by hole. So what we do is we'll add ah, premium mulch. This is just, here you go. This is compost. Okay, it's just chocolate looking compost. Mulch for you folks in the Midwest, I'm not talking about shredded bark. I'm talking about chocolate composted material that's breaking down. That's what we define mulch as in the West. Okay, so this is compost. Uh, you want to add about 25% mulch to your native soil. So that's about one shovel of mulch for every three shovels of, of native earth, okay? Some of you have cheated it, and I've gone up to 50-50. It's a little heavy because this stuff stays moist, it holds moisture in. Uh, but I can do that if you hit a big rock, you just need more. Some of you are just going to need to, you're going to filter out all these little tiny, I call them ankle busters, little tiny river rock things that are in the soil. By the time you get done filtering those out, you just need more. So you can go up to about 50-50. If you go heavier than that, probably not, not advisable. There we need to add some topsoil or something else that's not as heavy or as thick as, as mulch, okay? So you've got your hole dug, this pile of soil over here, we've screeded it or, thin, or, or filtered it. We've taken some mulch, we'll blend that all together. Um, and so, and then you'll use that material, that blended mulch and native, to backfill around this, this root and then pack it down. The bigger the man, the larger the boots, the better. Head, just pack it. We want no air pockets left in that. Now we're gonna start getting dry. So we've probably seen our last significant moisture until July 4th, and then it will just unleash. And we'll have five times as much moisture in July as we did the entire month of May and June. Okay, May and June is kind of a dry cycle happens every year. Everyone goes, we're going into drought. Oh no! It's every year it's the same. And every year, July 4th, it always rains. Always. I don't know how much, but it always has this monsoonal pattern. Um, when it gets really dry, what I'll do is when I've got that hole out, um, it's good to hydrate that hole if it's really dry. I'll fill it part way up with water. I'll just, while it's still open, the plant's not planted, I'll just fill it part way up with water. And so, uh, so I'm trying to hydrate the soil around the root ball. Many times we'll plant this, we'll, then we'll water the plant, and the ground around it is so dry that it just wicks away or sucks all the moisture out. And so your plant literally is left as though it had zero water. All the soil surrounding it uh, sucked it all out. So if it's really dry, go ahead and just front load that moisture as you're planting it and, and, and hydrate that surrounding soil. You're just trying to get the surrounding soil wet, okay? That's just a mistake I see newbies come into often. Uh, backfill around it, and then I'll also add, when I'm all done, I'll sprinkle a handful of all-purpose plant food. I'll just take this and put it on top and sprinkle it around. And this will break down, very because it's organic, it'll break down very slowly, and then over the next three months, just a little bit of food will feed that plant, so we encourage root growth. We really want roots. It's all about the roots. Okay, when I'm all watering it in, I'll water it in with, hold on, I'll water it in with root and grow. This is transplant shock. Your grandparents called it B1. B1, don't use that, it doesn't work. B1 and water and university testing does the same thing. It's basically fancy water in a bottle that they sold you for five bucks. It doesn't work, okay? Change the pH a little bit, that's it. This actually has a mild fertilizer rooting hormone in it, so as the roots as you break off a root, it will start to send off more root hairs, okay? Now, with all that, we we're setting the stage for how much of the root ball, how much do I beat this thing up? This is the perfect root ball. First of all, you're here at Waters Garden Center. 
We don't sell last year's leftovers. We're not going to do that. Those are the ones with root bound. They have roots going like this. Those are last year's. You'll find those at the big blue and orange box. We won't call them Home Depot and Lowe's. I call them Lucifer's Lowe's and Home Dumbo. But basically, they're my nemesis, OK? We, we want, I want nothing but ill for them. And they want nothing but ill for me. So that's just the way it is. We're competitors. Um, this, is, this is ideal. So this, I would barely, I might rough it up a little bit. And that would be about it. I'm not going to shave off, cut. I mean, what your grandparents did with beating up this thing till there was no soil left, don't do that. This is my baby. I love this. Now that, that's enough. Those, you still want those root hairs. You want to loosen it up. And it's mainly going to be in the bottom. You'll see more roots on the bottom. I might do that one just so the, the water can come up into, can get into the root ball. But that's about, that's about all I would do. And I'd plant that and just backfill it and go. Okay, some plants like cottonwoods, willows, sycamores, really aggressive, fast-growing trees, sometimes they'll have bigger roots. There, if I see a lot of roots coming down, I'll take my knife and just shave it. I'll just cut it. A couple, I'll just do, I'll just do this. A couple times, I'm just root pruning. That's all I'm doing, I'm just cutting the root, and every time it was cut, it'll send off two root hairs. So everywhere it's been cut. And that's all I would do, really. I try not to take the soil off very much, leaving that intact. That goes for my tomatoes, my peonies, big evergreens, spruce, pine, lilacs, whatever it is. That's the same technique. Okay. First of all, don't buy a plant that's root bound. It's bad. You just once roots start doing this, I don't care how much you manipulate them, they keep doing this. They're just trained, grow in circles, and so the plant literally will run out of soil within three to five years and it dies five years out, you go, what happened? And it's root bound. Okay? That's how to plant. Now, before you move now on. Now we do other questions. What? Before you move on, Robin has a question about whether she should leave part of the root exposed when she plants. Oh, that's okay, good. So I didn't explain that well enough. Uh, no, Robin, do not leave the root exposed. What you want to do is, yeah. This poor plant is getting a workout. So if I left them in real heavy clay soil, that 69 corridor all the way to Spring Valley, I mean, it's just it's rough. Um, I would leave that much of the root out of the ground, but I, would, I wouldn't leave it out of the ground. I would, I would mound up. I want to mound it. I want that much on a mound. And so I'll mound that up. So this is the top of the root. It can breathe. And I'll have that, that, that uh, native soil mulch mix kind of sloping down and, and feather it out to the surrounding soil. Did I explain that better? Yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, that, that's what I do. Okay. Don't put it into a dip, divot. Don't put it into a, into a hole. Don't do that. Well, you can, because if it dies, I know where you can buy another one. <laughs> I was seeing another kid to get through grad school and just had to make another payment. So uh, I just, but I'd rather for my friends, I just want success for you. That's, that's better. You know, it really is. Really, all of us are dealing with the same soil. It's, it's just a matter of how many rocks are in that soil. That seems to change. Up, as you get closer to Granite Mountain, it gets to more granite, more crushed granite. And there you want to add mulch into, there, into your soil because it's, so, it's this crushed granite. The water and food just goes whoof right through it. And so there you want to hold, add some moisture to it to keep, this, keep the water around that, that root ball. So otherwise, it dries out too, too fast. Actually, Granite Mountain's almost a harder place to grow. It flushes out so fast, the water. Then there's a hard pan layer about a foot to 18 inches down. It's just like granite. So it's like solid granite, only now it's turned into sand. It's kind of an awkward place. You've got to kind of read your soil, and each one of you is different in your gardens. I can tell you every time I plant, now this is kind of over and beyond. This is me. Okay? My name's Ken. We're just friends. And we're talking across the back fence, and this is working for me in my yards. Uh, every time we come out and plant for you, we always sprinkle a little bit of this in the bottom of the hole. This is, this is just that little extra. This is called Aqua Boost crystals, Aqua Boost. It's uh, polymers, so they swell up and hold like 200 times their weight in water. So they just, they hold, they turn into a big gelatin, gooey, hold the moisture around the root ball. And then we've infused this, this is kind of something we make ourselves 
we infuse the polymers with, with mycorrhizal fungi. Mainly because I know a lot of you have these new homes, and there's no living thing in there. I'm trying to juice your plants, your soil, so it will become alive again. If you add some mulch to it, a little bit of aqua boost, it will all of a sudden start, start um, becoming alive. So if you've got really rich um, organic beds, like raised beds, or, or you've been working a garden for a long time, you'll dig down, you'll see this white powdery, white powdery substance. Those are mycorrhizal colonies, and that's like magic to your, to your plants. They just think that's the greatest thing ever. So whenever I find those, they're pretty rare to find. When I find them, I'm like, oh, I've got those, I'm going to sprinkle them around my yard so that it spreads my mycorrhizal colonies. This is a beneficial that plants feed off of and want to root deeper. So now you've got a product, AquaBoost will hold moisture around the roots and encourage more root, more root growth. So that's kind of something I do. So every time we plant, we'll just sprinkle a little bit in the bottom kind of hold some moisture in there. And then as the, the crystals swell and shrink, swell and shrink with water, it keeps the pores and the soil open. So anyway, that's over and beyond. There you go. Thank you, Robin, for asking that. Let's go to the plant, shall we? So that's how to plant. Um, be really careful with, get rid of this. Be really careful with the dry wash. You know, it seems like we have a lot of, we don't have water here. Uh, you know what the meaning of Hacienda River means? Uh, the native, the Yavapai say that that's the definition is river that disappears, disappearing river. So it goes subterranean, and the water's still flowing, it's still there, but it's subterranean, and it'll pop up all of a sudden, just magically. Over here, it starts running the surface, then it'll go back, just a disappearing river. So a lot of us have these dry creek beds that are either bone dry, they're just for looks, or they only fill up during the monsoonal wet patterns. Be careful with those areas because they continue to flood and they'll drown your plants. Just watch. I wouldn't plant too close to the bottom. I'd be up on the edges. So my plant, so when it does, we get a really wet cycle. It's not going to drown your plants. Okay? Get rid of these. So I can reset. Oh. Before I do that, here's kind of a so a lot of you have uh, natives, you bought your lot because of that beautiful pinion pine or the, the ponderosa groves that are just, the trunks on them are like this. You built your house around, the, the deck is built around the trees. Uh, some of you have got some really specimen trees. And if you lose one of those, it is re irreplaceable. They're worth thousands. I mean, they're, they're hundreds of years old. Yet you've changed the environment in which they live. So they've been living there for hundreds of years, but now that was before all the asphalt, the rooftops, and heat island effect. And now, and now they can't go on their own. They need a little bit of help. Don't go crazy. I just tell you, I would say if I had a really valuable native, beautiful juniper that's just like, I mean, the bark is just so unusual. I've got one that's just magnificent. I uplight it, I downlight it, I've got art underneath it. It's magnificent. It is a living piece of art. Unfortunately, it's a big male, so he wanted to like pollinate the world this year, uh, but still, it's still a beautiful tree. Um, what I do, what I recommend for your natives in the month of April, May, June, three are three hottest, driest months. We're about to go to 10% humidity, prevailing southwest wind. It will not stop, day or night. Constant blows from the southwest um, and bone dry, which is no moisture until July. We're going into that. If you got a plant where you had to sever some roots to get a driveway in, or you just you've changed the way the water flows off that hill, I would recommend watering your significant natives, not the whole forest, just the ones that are really valuable. I'd take a soaker hose, just drag it underneath there and run it for half a day. One time in the month of April, May, and June. So that'll keep them healthy. When we had bark beetle outbreaks for the ponderosas, I mean, it decimated entire neighborhoods. Not one tree was left, all dead. Scale got in the pinyon pines. Not one tree is left in a neighborhood. But those trees that were cared for by watering it once a month, and they fertilized it once a year with all-purpose plant food, those trees thrived, lived, kept going. She kept them healthy. This is uh, the cottonseed meal in this. It's the main ingredient. It's got some bird guano. Put some iron and sulfur. 
some fairy dust. I mean, it's got some magic in it. It really does work, but evergreens love this stuff because it makes it more acidic, brings out the color. So if you fertilize it once, don't go crazy. Native, these are natives. They just need a little bit of care. And they'll, they'll, they'll thrive. They can fight the bark beetles and ips beetle, flathead borers, all the things that go after them. They can fight that. So just kind of some insider tips on it. And then lastly, and I'll move on from fertilizer because this is not a fertilizer talk. There's a lot of Colorado spruce, some ancient ones, I mean, 100 year old spruce. They're 50, 60, 70 feet tall. They're magnificent. Um, they naturalize very well. Um, some of them go more yellow on us. They should be blue to almost silver. You've got a tree that's like got this great color, and now it's faded over the years. Um, here's how I can make you a rock star in your neighborhood. How did you do that? Oh my gosh, you're such a good gardener. Um, sprinkle some aluminum sulfate on that plant in the spring. Aluminum, they pick up the, the aluminum, and that's what causes that silver hue, that color to it. So they use this mainly for hydrangeas to bring out the, the blue, blue color, or hollies, or daffies bring out the, flavor, the, the fragrance. But it really works for us in the mountains on our evergreens, and especially those that are more colorful. So the Arizona cypress, it's got a kind of a silvery color to it. A lot of our junipers, like Wichita blues, have a lot of silver to them. You give them aluminum, and man, they just come out. They almost glow at night. I mean, it's like a like the moon wants to pick up on them and make them silver. That's that's kind of one thing that'll really help you. Without that, if you just let your your evergreens go, no no food, you don't do anything. They'll just slowly turn yellow. They'll be thin and wispy. They should be thick, like a tropical plant. Tr tropical uh, uh, plant. If they look thin and you can see the layering to them, that means there's not enough food. They're starving to death. You just give them a little bit of the all-purpose food. Um, and, and the aluminum sulfate's not for everyone. It's just uh, you really want to be noted as a really good gardener. That's kind of one, one thing I do. You go, Ken, how'd you do that? Well, let me show you how. It's really easy. Okay, let's go over the plants, shall we? Yes. What do you do special for aspens? Aspens do well. You know, Aspen Creek is right here. You can walk up there. I mean, it's just we, aspens grow wild at this level and above. Um, in fact, we didn't think aspens used to be able to live on the valley areas. And we've proved that, totally disproved that. They do very well, beautiful specimens. Prescott Valley, Dewey, those areas, beautiful. And so you can grow them. They, you might have to keep them on a drip system to keep them healthy. The main thing of the watch for aspens, there's a natural leaf spot. There's a black kind of fungal thing that gets on them. Some years it's worse than others. I think it depends on the monsoonal rains. If it's real wet that summer, you'll see a lot of leaf spot. It doesn't kill them. Um, it just makes them look ugly. They'll shed their leaves and then they set reset. If you saw that, cleanup is everything. So just rake up all those last year's leaves. Rake those up because that disease, that leaf spot, the, the birds will be pecking around in the, in the leaves and they'll kind of jump up on the new leaves and it spreads just like that. Or if your neighbors down the street had it and then they come in, you just kind of watch for it. If you see it, come talk to us. We can show you how to how to deal with it. And then I would say with aspens, especially fertilize, fertilize, fertilize. I'd fertilize the all-purpose food aspens three times a year. Uh, Easter, Fourth of July, Halloween, spring, spring food. They're hungry when they wake up. Take advantage of the, the rain in July. That's why it's July Fourth. And then the most important feeding of all plants, especially those things that bloom, especially those things that bloom in the spring. It's going to be your fall fertilizer, October. So you need to fertilize more often here because literally you have nothing in your ground. You don't have that eight foot of topsoil like you had in Iowa. You don't. You've got. You don't even have eight millimeters. You got nothing. I mean, literally, you got. They're more dependent on you for food. So you need to be more regular. That's the big, big takeaway I'd go for your aspens. Okay, let's start with the most native of all of them. What everyone thinks of natives, and that's that's here. Um, now, first of all, a lot of folks from the East Coast, Midwest, they want to come in and they think all of Arizona is saguaros and like cacti. And that's all I want, saguaros and cacti. Where are they? I'm going, we don't have those. They don't grow up here. You can't, what? Push it out a little bit. So oh, really? So people can see it. Really? You're oh, in the I shadow. See. Oh, shadow, got it, got it, got it. You want me to bring this out here so they can see the light? But this could be dangerous for these folks in the spit zone. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can get it out there in the light. 
This is a pancake cactus. This one will grow here. Of course, prickly pears. Those are pretty tough. Uh, so this will go down to about zero degrees. It's got antifreeze in it, so some plants have naturally occurring antifreeze. So we can go you know, below freezing, and they're fine. Uh, things like lilacs, they can go down to minus 40 degrees before they freeze. They have that much antifreeze in them. Prickly pears, most cacti have zero. So if you go down to Phoenix, get that beautiful little Argentine cactus, bring it up here, it will, it will love you. It will thrive and celebrate its life until about Thanksgiving. And then all of a sudden it will turn, get a hard freeze, it will turn to black mush, it will fall over and die. And it's a painful thing to watch because it turns to black mush. And it just, it, oh, it just hurts me. Um, don't bring things up from the valley up to here. The valley meaning Phoenix, not, not Prescott Valley, not Chino Valley, but from Phoenix up here. They won't migrate. They won't come up. They'll live through the summer. They'll die in the winter. This one will thrive. You're on this one. You'll see out towards uh, Spring Valley, Cortis Junction, just over the other side of the hill, past uh, Iron Springs Community, coming down off uh, towards Skull Valley. Uh, you'll see a, a prickly pear that's almost grows up into a bush. Has almost a trunk and then multiple pads coming up. That's this guy. Okay. Also, we've got the little Rita's, the little ground cover looking uh, prickly pears. Those work really well. If you're trying to plant this by yourself, be very careful. Yeah. It's sticky. Um, what I'll do is I'll dig my hole and get it all ready. I'll just take my pruners and I'll prune this off. I'll pick it up by the root ball and I'll set it down and then backfill. That's how I do it. Some folks you'll read on the internet say take newspaper and manipulate this because the, 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 the needles won't go through newspaper. I just find cut the bucket off, pick it up by the root and put plant it. It's so much easier. Sometimes the internet makes life hard. Like, what do I do? I don't understand. There's too many choices. Um, this one I would not put on drip system at all. You are going to overwater this. This one is neglected. I mean, curse at it. Kick dirt at it. It likes that. Abuse it. Because you don't want to overwater this. Okay, this is one I would not put on irrigation. Most things I'll put on drip irrigation for a year, and I'll bend back that irrigation emitter tape it off so it, will, so it won't run out. I'll leave it on irrigation until it's up to size, then I'll, I'll cut it off in the care. I want to I force it up to look mature, okay? Cactus. Can I ask a question? Sure. How much do you water it at first though to kind of get it a How much should I water cactus specifically? Yeah. At first? I would deep soak it till it is just soggy wet at first. Because again, I'm not trying to water the cactus. I'm trying to water the soil around that plant. That go for manzanitas and these others. I'll, I'll mention to you as well. Kind of goes for this guy. Um, I do want to water it really well, and then I want to let it breathe and dry out. And that might take two weeks. We got to water it again. It might be two months in the rainy cycle if we get the rains. If you're watching that, this is a. a uh, oh, look at that! So happy it's starting to come out the side. That's been interesting. <laughs> Um, this is a, a artichoke agave. It's also the nickname is century plant. And when it starts, it, it says the rumor is it blooms once every hundred years. That's the name century plant. That's a bunch of hog pooey. That does not. They bloom about every 20 years, 15, 20. It depends on where they're at. This is one that has a huge stalk. It grows almost. It's kind of fun to watch it grow by day. Gets up to about 15 feet or so. And has a pretty flower. Uh, and then the mother plant, when that does that, dies. But then you'll see what it wants to do. It wants to put on pups. It wants to put on runners, side runners. So then the family of plants will start to grow. So in nature, what it does, it grows up really tall, has seeds, and it falls over. And now the seed will come out about 15 feet away over here. And then as babies, families will keep growing underneath her. So that's how it naturally grows. Be careful when you fertilize these. I've got one of these, it's maybe 10 years old. It's magnificent. I mean, it's just like, it's three feet wide, three feet tall. It's what you want an agave to be. I mean, it's a, it's a rock star. Um, I never water it. I watered it for the first year, and that was it. And I let it, it's been on its own ever since. Um, and it's magnificent. I fully expect it to start blooming. Probably the next time we go into drought, it'll, it'll bloom. So when it gets stressed a little bit, it'll start to, it'll, that'll be the trigger to have it start blooming. Um, this one, be careful. The only thing that makes me nervous is 
I've got grandkids, I've got two grandsons, and boys, there's something about boys, and like rough housing, running, and I, this thing's got skewers on each pad. So kind of watch that one. If that's really a concern, you could probably nip those off. Just nip them and that would get rid of that. But that's part of the, I think it's part of the beauty of an agave. We'll have whale's tongue, the Utahgensis, one that grows up on the canyon, uh, 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 perii, the agave uh, uh, century plant. The negative with these is uh, blue agave, the one they make for, with, uh, they make tequila out of, magnificent blue. It's about this big and it's beautiful. I have really tried to make that grow and it's not hardy for up here. So the, the family of agaves are very large. You want to make sure you get the ones that can take the cold. The winter is what will take these out. So these, these grow up on the ridge line. So the, there's hardy varieties. So we are a zone seven, seven, okay? A zone eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 will not grow here. 10, 11, 12, that's Phoenix. It's gotta be desert. I mean, those plants don't like to go below 40 degrees, really. Uh, this plant's a zone 6B, I believe. This will go down to minus 10, something like that. It still survive, be great. Okay, so this is a hardy variety of agave. Uh, same with cactus. There's different zones. Look for a zone. So zone 7, 6, 5, or 3, 2, 1 will grow here. So 7 or below, the smaller the number, the hardier it is, will grow here. Above that, won't. Okay. Now let's go to our local rock star. This is Manzanita. So you'll see this growing wild. They get up about head high or so. Big evergreen shrub. Uh, red bark. That's a Manzanita. We're trying to introduce more and more Manzanitas because they do so well here. This is another one I would not put in a drip system. I would water this by hand. If you're going to kill this, it will be from over water. And what makes this so tough, it looks innocent, but what makes it so tough is the leaves are very leathery and waxy. So it has super efficient on its, uh, on its moisture use. So it brings in the moisture, locks it in, doesn't let it go. So it's very, very efficient. And the root structure on these are massive. They're about six inches down, maybe a foot, and they just spread out like this. So they're looking to pick up moisture whenever they can, whenever there's a moisture cycle, they're picking up the moisture. So this one, I have killed personally five of these myself in my own gardens. So I live up in Eagle Ridge, I'm on a north slope, doesn't see a lot of sun, super heavy clay. And I think I'm also, now I, I've learned never ever tell a gardener what they can or cannot do. They will find a way. And I'm gonna figure out how to grow this, because I want one. But my soil is so heavy and gooey and soggy, that snow loads up on that north slope. And you know, that big snow we had in March, that stayed until April. I mean, it was ridiculous how long that had snow in the backyard because it was all shaded. Well, that kind of moisture is gonna be hard on these. So I think I'm gonna try this. I think my way out of this, I'm gonna put this in a container. <laughs> I'm gonna cheat. Let's put it, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do this, there. I'm literally gonna do this. I'm just going to throw it in this. For sure, I've got drainage now. No problem. I'm put a potting soil on it, ultimate drainage. And then when I get this thing done blooming, it'll be this magnificent green. I can trim it, shape it, almost make it into an art form. And then I can go on my vacation, visit the grandkids. The irrigation can collapse for two weeks, three weeks. And still, this thing will grow and thrive, and I won't have to worry about it. So I think that's what I'm going to do this year, is plant this thing in a, in a, in a pot. Yep. About trimming manzanita. So she's got huge manzanita. How does she trim it? Generally, we don't trim them. We let them go. But what you could do is just bring it back to size. And I would say do it now. What I try to do with my evergreens, this is all evergreens, whether it's a red tip botania hedge, or a silverberry hedge, whatever it is, you want us. I try to prune it right before it grows. Because it'll, it'll look butchered. I mean, you'll see the cut marks. You'll see where it just looks bad. It's like, oh, what was she thinking? Oh my gosh, I just want to slap her. But if you just cut it right before they start flushing growth, they have less ugly cycle, less of that cut back look, and they'll start to flush new growth. And usually that's the month of March, April, somewhere. Usually March is when I try to trim back most of my evergreen things. 
But manzanita has not started to grow yet. I'd say go for it. Just cut her, cut her right back. <coughs> what the book says is cut no more than one third of the foliage mass in one season. Does that make sense? I'm just quoting the encyclopedia to you. It's kind of a curse. I'm a walking garden encyclopedia. How big did those get? Okay, I've got four or five different models of manzanita. I've got Knick Knick or Bearberry. It's a ground cover. Only gets two inches, <laughs> ankle high or less. Just, just grows like this. I've got uh, uh, knee highs. This one's hip high. I've got a chest high. A Howard McMahon gets the big ones. They all have the same foliage pretty much. They all have the red bark. They're all manzanita. So it's a big family of plants and they're all equally as hard and equally as tough, okay? This is the companion plant to, I almost thought it'd be bad again. That just looks good too. I like it, I have over 50 pots in my, in my house. So between the front yards and backyards, it's just, we have pots everywhere. Because they're so easy to grow and they're pretty. I mean, in the, I mean, I've been collecting them for decades, but they're just pretty, even without, full, without anything in them in winter, they're pretty. And so we normally have something growing in them year round, evergreens, flowers, that kind of stuff. This is gray leaf ketoniaster. It grows wild out in the uh, uh, native areas. You'll see this growing just wild up near Thumb Thumb Butte, those areas. Uh, an evergreen bush about, I don't know, three, four feet tall, this smaller gray leaf. Ketoniaster is great, or the way you spell it, cotton easter is how everyone says it or spells it. It's actually ketoniaster. Um, this was a native. It's got a very waxy leaf. The leaves are smaller, you'll notice. So small, they, they're, they're being more efficient. They're trying to reduce their exposure to the dry air. So you do that by shrinking down your foliage. And then you wax coat it. And then it's actually, if you take a close look at this, you'll only see green on the top side. The back side is silver or gray. That's where that color is coming from. And so it actually has coated the back side so that it cannot perspire on the back side of the leaf. It's only exposed to the elements on one side, the top. So you'll see this two-toned color to it when you take a close look. And that's what makes it such a tough native plant. It's, it's, it's training, it's trained itself. Plants are actually quite smart. They train themselves to be more efficient in this environment. That's why it's a true zero scape native plant. Again, grow this one up to the height you want, get it like this big, cut it off of all care. Never water it again. And it'll be just, just happy, just for years and years. This is the one you're about to see bloom. I'm gonna get, this is not doing me any favors. So this is about to bloom. We're trying to stock up now because when, it, when they start to bloom, there'll be this tidal wave of customers coming and going, what's that shrub that looks blooming yellow, really fragrant? Oh, that's a broom, B-R-O-O-M, broom. Um, we've got Spanish broom, Scotch broom. There's like this a whole family of different brooms. Uh, basically, they're going to be a, a fairly large shrub. I think of them as a pencil plant. You're from Florida, those areas, a tropical succulent. Kind of looks like that, only it does have a tiny, tiny leaf. This plant, you'll notice it's green. The stem, it's actually got leaves, but the stems are also green. So it's creating photosynthesis, not just through the foliage, but also through the stems itself. It's very waxy, so it's very efficient on water. I planted this just outside my lawn once, so I got a lawn for the kids to, you know, play soccer on that kind of stuff. And just I was probably three, four feet away from the lawn, and uh, still it's keep being over water. I had to cut it off of, I had to kind of raise it up, get it out out of the lawn overflow, and I took it off the of all drip system, and, and then it started to thrive. So this is super efficient. But when you see a yellow bush about my height, about this wide, it's in bloom here in the next couple weeks, that's a broom. So you can drive down the road, and impress your golf buddies, and oh yeah, there's a, uh, that's a broom. You should smell that, it smells so good. Uh, you'll cut them off, bring them in vases, bring, bring them into the house. They'll fill up the entire backyard with this wonderful, I think even sweeter fragrance, even a lilac. So it's a great plant for here. This is what I'm trying to reintroduce. This is a very old-fashioned plant. Anyone know what this is? Pyracantha, very good. This is victory pyracantha. Remember as a kid, you used to pick the red berries, you know, chuck them at each other, and you know, cars, your mom. Uh, this, is, this is one that, that's evergreen. 
it's very tough, very efficient on its water use, because again, the leaves are very waxy. You'll see that's a theme. It's, it's, it's trying to conserve water to it. It has this wonderful flower to it, and each of these flowers will turn into a red berry. Okay? The negative with this is, just this is where you want a gardener, or good thick gloves. The other name for this is called fire thorn. It's got a thorn about that big, so it wants to, it wants to reach out and hug you. It just wants to get you. Uh, so kind of watch that one, but great for fences, uh, privacy screens. If the kids are cutting across your, your property and put a couple of these in, they'll stop that right away. Uh, dogs coming in and peeing on your front, they're not going to do that with this plant because it'll reach out and kind of give you a great big thorny kiss. So pyracantha, very tough plant. I expect this went in often in commercial settings. In commercial business owners, they don't take care of stuff. They're busy doing other things. So they need plants that are really tough, but they need plants that look good. So this one fits that bill. We'll put them in parking lots, that kind of stuff, and they just thrive. Two plants that are kind of companions to each other. My lilac has started to bloom. They're starting to bloom all over town. Lilacs, I would consider drop low, low water, drop hardy. They're very deep rooted, very tough. They're deciduous, that is, they'll lose their leaves. So they're only going to use water during the growing season, and then they really don't need anything. So they're very efficient on their water use. Uh, but this is the one that has that great big uh, pinnacle like flower to it that's, that's very famous for its fragrance. That's lilac. This is called Prescott Purple Lilac. There's a common one that's been around for decades and decades. If in doubt, they seem to all revert back to this purple, this classic kind of Purple flower. This one just opened up this morning, it looks like. It's going to, in another couple days, it'll be in full bloom. But this is a great little shrub about head high, this big. If you're new to the area and you're from more tropical climates like Hawaii, Palm Springs, you haven't had this four season opportunity, you need a lilac. You, you can grow them here. They, they do so well uh, that you need to have one. You need to have fun with this. So lilacs do well. The companion to that, this one blooms in the spring, this one blooms in the summer. This is called a summer lilac or butterfly bush, okay? Butterfly bush has the same flower. It's not as fragrant, I don't think, uh, but it's, it's equally as pretty. And the benefit with this, this goes into bloom as the swallowtails, painted ladies, the monarchs start to migrate through. And you will always see butterflies on these. It's like a magnet. They, can't, they cannot resist it. They must go suck the nectar from butterfly bush. So it's a great little plant. The negative with this one, over the lilac, it tends to be short-lived. So a lot of it, if you bought that home and you're not the first one to, you're, you're taking over someone else's landscape, they've got an old lilac and it just looks mangy looking or woody. Um, it's probably coming down to its, its life cycle. It's got a life cycle of about 10 years, eight, eight to 10 years, somewhere in there. It will live longer, but you'll hate it the last five years. They'll just be ugly, bringing you down. I think we need to replace these a little more often. I think every yard should have a, light, a butterfly bush, um, but, but sometimes you keep them, you gardeners especially, you know who you are, you keep them too long. I can nurse it back to life. I can bring it back, it'll be okay. Talk to me. Yeah, I'd probably just take the shovel, pop it out, put a new one. 20 bucks, you have a new one, a new color, so. No, the lilacs are much longer lived. Lilacs will live, will, will outlive you easily. You and me both combined, they're gonna outlive us. But butterfly bush doesn't. Another one that's like that, this one. That is Russian sage. Russian sage, every yard needs one. Uh, gets up about hip high or so. About this has blue spikes. All over, the whole top of it is just blue. It's very drought hardy. Uh, it's a little bit early. It's just starting to leaf out. I see one flower bud. So another couple weeks, it'll start to bloom. This is a summer through fall bloomer. Um, this one, again, is short-lived. Uh, it tends to be rather aggressive, so don't plant, plant it. Don't, don't overplant these. A, a few of these is good enough because you're going to get more. They tend to run, come up, and they tend to reseed in places. So kind of watch that one. I think there's some maintenance with Russian sage. Don't let it just do its own thing. You're going to have to control it. And so I'll take a shovel and just pop out the runners going, no, 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 you're not growing here. No, that's, that's no wrong. 
And as I see him come up in the rock, I go, no, 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 that's not going to happen. If it comes up where I want it, I'll encourage it. Usually that, that rarely happens. Okay, that, and also as this thing matures, it'll get about this big around, and then it'll start to die out in the middle. There's a life cycle with these. It's about, again, like butterfly bush, about eight to 10 years. You just need to reset and start over. It just for a little bit, for a few bucks, you have a brand new plant start over, or you can have this mangy looking thing that looks like it's spreading out, it just kind of looks overgrown. And th these things pop out with, I mean, anyone can do it. Shovel, they pop out really fast. So sometimes we need to reset a Russian sage. Yeah. Could you put that in a container? To oh, yeah. Contain it? Could, could you put it in a container? It would lo look really good as a container. The only negative with a container, I like things that look good year round. And this one's kind of ugly in the winter. There's about six months where you're just going, you already even see it. It's just, just this twiggy thing in the yard. So it's not exactly, it's a rock star when it's in bloom, but other than that, it's kind of an ugly plant. So yes, you could. This is a hardcore native. I use this a lot. Um, I use this to, to uh, when I'm designing. I'll uh, hide that electrical box, that big square APS box. Why they can't put that in the ground or something? I don't know. So I'm not a slap an engineer there. But basically, it's, it's ugly. I don't want to see it. So I'll plant this, because this is APS yellow, uh, you know, or, or beige, whatever color they try to do it. It's an evergreen, gets up to about, I don't know, head high or so. Um, this one is hardier than red tip botinia. I would never bring red tip botinia. That's one with the new red girt leaves coming out right now. I would never bring that to this class. And I would never plant one myself. I love selling them. I'm putting my kid through grad school on red tip botinia, Russian sage alone. Uh, but it's red tip botinia is a big plant. It's too big for most, most yards. Gets up 10, 12, 12, 15 feet tall by wide. Again, small dogs, children have been lost in red tip botinia. So get, it's way too aggressive. Uh, too much maintenance. I need, if you got a gardener, that's different. It's going to be in every week to shave this thing down and keep it under control. This is a much better alternative. And deer do not eat this. This does not get powdery mildew like red tip, red tip potinia does. I mean, it just, it's just a better choice. And it's a native. So once it gets up to size, I never water it again. So I've got some that are, I've got big cedar fences. And it's just, it's just sterile. I want it to feel more like a secret garden. And so I planted some of these in front of the cedar, which is kind of dark. This is a light colored. Um, and so it tends to pop. This is called silverberry is the name of it, Silverberry. Um, the, the Latin name is Eli Agnes. Just think the name Eli and then Agnes, put them together. Uh, but the, the, name, the common name is Silverberry. It has a fragrant flower to it. You'll see, it, see one that's truly native. It's got a blue leaf instead of this gold. It's not quite as pretty as the gold. I like that gold color. The yellow just seems, seems to pop, especially in Arizona, kind of high desert kind of landscapes. But most yellow plants will burn on you. The sun is too intense. This one loves that. It takes every bit of it. And you'll notice, again, it's got this variegated leaf to it. The backside is white, so it's only perspiring on the top of the leaf. So it's not going to perspire at all on the back. Let's put this coating on it. And then it's very waxy. We should pass that around so you can kind of get a feel. That's that's a classic native native uh, type of type of defense that it uses. Okay. Just for you folks online, thanks for tuning in. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. Um, this is a great evergreen, thick, privacy, hedge kind of thing. Loves to be pruned on. For me, I let mine go more wild. And so every once in a while I get this wild branch comes out. So in the winter, I'll just cut that off, kind of shape it a little bit. That's all I do. Very minimal care very uh, frugal on the water, that kind of stuff. This one is a rock star right now. Um, this is Indian hawthorn, or raphaeolyptus. Uh, Indian hawthorn is how you ask for it. We're trying to introduce more and more of these. They're a little plant. They don't get that big. But they do this every spring. They have this fragrant pink to white to apple blossom. It's kind of white to light pink flower to it. When it's done blooming, it just has this wonderful evergreen foliage that, that just stays nice, compact, mounding, 
hardly needs any care. You'll never have to prune on it. This would look great in a container because it looks good year round. All 12 months looks fabulous. And then the, the, it looks so good, the, the flowers are almost just like a bonus, like frosting. It looks good with or without flowers. Indian hawthorn is a great little plant for your, again, if you look closely at the foliage, very thick, very leathery, and waxy, which makes it very efficient. Oh, hip high or lower. I've got some that stay knee, knee high, some that grow, they're, they're, they'll be in this range in the model that you have. I've got probably four or five different varieties. I brought this one only because it's blooming. I mean, it's just pretty. Look at that. It just looks good. I would not bring just a green one. Can you leave it in the pot over the winter? I would not leave any of these. So can, can we leave this in the pot over the winter? I wouldn't leave any of the plants in the pot for more than maybe six months. Eventually, they're going to get root bound. And they're going to start to, the, 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 the roots will start circling or, or coming bound. And once they start circling, they don't stop. They just keep doing this. And now they become more and more and more dependent on you. I think it'd be better to put in a pot or where it has more soil. I could upsize the pot or I'd put it in the ground where it can just start growing, especially these are natives. Of course, the most famous of all the, what you see in the front of magazines right now, where's that at? This, this kind of look. You've seen this or this up on a pillar in a courtyard in a cobalt blue or a mocha glazed pot. And that's just, they, they're using the textures of yuccas and agaves and they're just showing off the, the structure. They don't even want it to flower. This has a beautiful white flower. Hummingbirds just love it. But they're using it just for this, this striking uh, color change in this very structured, defined courtyard. They have this wild looking, kind of like feng shui or sweet and sour kind of thing. So that, yuccas do really well. Lots of varieties grow here in different, different forms. So banana yuccas are big. This one is a gold sword. This is a new one I'll bring to you. Red yuccas are a dime a dozen. I've sold thousands of them. I'm getting bored. So this one came out. This is a red yucca, um, but it's called, called Coral Glow Texas Yucca. It's as hardy as our red yuccas. There's a, there's a yucca about this tall. It's this red flower and it blooms like crazy all summer long. This one does that on steroids. It gets up to this big. Now it's a shrub size with the same red flowers that comes out. So if you've got a great big sterile rock walls, cinder block, let's face it, eastern block. If you're in Russia, cinder block's great. Is it in Prescott, Arizona? Uh, maybe there's some other choices. Let's soften that up. Let's put a pergola or let's put some trellis and soften that up. You want to create a secret garden feel. Well, this is when I'm plugging into the corners where I need something really tough, radiant heat. Uh, and I want it to get big enough to soften that thing up. This would be great for that. It's a very, very tough little plant. Yuccas do great. Yeah. Would you uh, plant those just like you said the other uh, bushes? I would plant yuccas. all of these the same way. Same planting technique. Make sure it drains, test it, add some organics, invigorate the soil, and then don't overwater. Most of these I would probably water by hand as they look like they need it. This is bare grass. I know it doesn't look like much. Again, natives, some of them look ugly. Bare grass grows wild out in the valleys from Chino Paulden, Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, Dewey, that whole valley area. They'll be at uh, Pioneer Park, you just see them around. This big grass, evergreen grass, about this tall. And then in the summer and through the fall, it has this white flower that kind of elongates up. And so that's bare grass, B-E-A, like bear, Rrr. bare grass. Um, this one, the mistake you make, watch your gardeners. Don't let them butcher this plant. They'll cut it right back like it's a pampas grass or something. It will take years to recover. This is an evergreen grass. It's not meant to be pruned back. You can cut the flower off, so I'll cut that off, but I won't cut the foliage back. Uh, same with your yuccas. It's just, just, this is embarrassing. So now, I'm a landscaper. Uh, I'm not a landscaper. I've been a landscape contractor, I've run a lot of landscapers. Quite honestly, most landscape companies, definitely maintenance guys, they couldn't get a job anywhere else, but they owned a shovel and a pickup truck. And now they're in the business, I'm a professional. You know, I went to Waters Garden Center once, and now I'm a professional, I know what to do. 
They're idiots. Not all of them, not all of them, but God, just I'm embarrassed sometimes by what I see. And here's one thing that embarrasses me. They'll come in, they'll cut this one back. Uh, down median strips to communities, they cut them right, whack them right off. And it will take years for this to recover. This is not a grass. This is meant to stay up. Uh, this flower that's coming up here, that one will, will elongate and come back like this. Right now they look dead and twiggy. I would go back and cut that flower stem off, but I wouldn't cut the foliage back. So make sure you tell your gardeners, you know, don't, you can use my name if you want. Ken said, don't cut that back. Uh, but don't let them butcher your, 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 your plants, okay? That one also, when you're fertilizing these, be careful. I mean, the agave is a better example. Be careful when you're fertilizing. The reason this one works so well, we don't have time, we're starting to run out. We're not going to get to all the plants. Sorry. You'll have to come back and talk to us one on one when you're ready to plant. But you'll see how these pads are coming up like this. See, the, that's a natural thing. What it's trying to do is, when it rains, it's trying to collect more rain. It's rain harvest. It's trying to bring the rain into the heart of that, that plant. So it's a strategic thing it's doing to bring more water to the, to the, to the uh, root. And the root is very, very fleshy, like a big carrot. Um, so watch that when you're fertilizing these. When I fertilize this, which I do fertilize mine once a year, I'll make sure I take a handle, I'll just sprinkle around the edges. I want to make sure I don't put fertilizer in here or it brings it in, pulls it to the heart, and then you can burn the heart out. That's, that's kind of a, a rookie mistake I've seen too many people make. So just some insider tips, something to watch for. Okay, let's see, let's do... Yeah. Can you transplant the bear grass? Can you transplant natives? Yes. So, no. You'll, really, what it comes down to, you'll have maybe one out of ten transplant. The other nine will die. It's just almost not worth taking your time. And I don't care what the native is. Manzanita, bear grass, yucca, they just don't train. That root goes down about two feet, turns, starts running this way. It goes for miles. I mean, it just goes hundreds of feet. So when you try to transplant, you sever too much of the root, you can never get enough to gather up and transplant, whether it's a pinion pine or whatever it is. And I've tried and tried and tried. These are two that I use quite a bit. This is lavender, okay? I'll just give you a quick lavender lesson. It's way more detailed than I should go into, but here you go. This is Spanish lavender. It's a new variety. You're only gonna find it at Waters. I know I was gonna have some gardeners and I gotta wow the gardeners with something they've never seen before. You've never seen this before. This is uh, silver foliage. Um, it's called Ghost Princess. But normally, uh, lavender's got blue foliage, it's got silver. And then, almost always, it's got blue flowers. It's got more of a pink hue to it. This is more traditional. This is the hardiest of all of the lavenders. This is English lavender. It is the toughest of all of them. Some years, the Spanish lavenders, French lavenders can be, cut, can be killed off. Um, but they're just so pretty. They're the ones you see in the front of magazines. So I do plant some of those, and they'll grow for years. But if you just want something to go out there by themselves and thrive more, which is kind of what this class is, use the English or Goodwin lavender. This one will be tougher, OK? Here's your lesson on lavenders. This one I use often. I use this one in my own yard. I've got pack rats, I've got rabbits. Uh, uh, animals don't eat herbs. This is an herb. Uh, this is called Santalina, or lavender cotton. I use this because I've got the classic mountain home. I'm on a hillside. The vistas are magnificent. I'm overlooking the dells, the peaks, Granite Mountain. I mean, it's wonderful. The problem is I'm on a slope. And so I drive straight into, my, into the first floor, go downstairs to the second floor, and you go down another flight of stairs into the backyard. So I got steps. We love to entertain. The bigger the party, the more friends, the better. We have big families. We get together often. Loud and Lane both start with L. So we love to get, and it gets, it's a ruckus. It is a hoot. Um, I'll use this from the stairs from the garage down the side of the yard to the backyard. It's kind of treacherous, especially at night. And I've got landscape lighting. I mean, it looks like a resort. I mean, it's beautiful. But sometimes it's real dark. If the moon's not out, it's just, it's dark. And so I'll plant these next to the steps sporadically. And then even in the darkest of night, this glows, just glows, and it's evergreen. So no matter when I'm out there, this is just tough, glows in the dark, has a kind of a scent to it. Animals don't eat it. 
And the bonus is it gets a yellow flower on it in the late, late spring, early summer. So Santalina is a great little plant that just naturalizes, only gets about this tall. About every other year, I'll take the mower and just whack it right off and have it reset and start over again. Other than that, I just leave it alone and let it go itself. Okay. Otherwise, it tends to get overgrown and it wants it keeps growing, mounting out. Then it starts to encroach on the steps. I'm going, no, 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 you're not doing that. I want the steps, people first, plant second. And so I have to coach it back into its space. Santolina. God. Oh man, I could keep going for hours. It's what I do for a living. You know I do this every day, all day long, all of us. So this is kind of what I do. And this is only the ones I kind of had fun with. These aren't even the toughest of the natives. I'll send that list to you though, you'll have that. It'll be more, I mean, it's really fine print, so you have to upsize the screen size font to see it all, but you'll have the, the common name and the Latin name both, so you can do your research, okay? This one I use quite a bit. In my backyard, I have several of these. This is called um, Old Gold Juniper. I like gold, because a lot of our rock, I've got mocha colored, I don't even put rock back there. I've got shredded bark and that kind of stuff, so it's dark soil. It's very pretty, very natural. Ponds are flowing, birds are all over the place. Dry creek bed. And then I wanted to spot some bright spots. So I put this with, well, where did my Russian sage go to? Well, basically I put it with some of these, this colored stuff. So you put those two things together, it just pops. It's a great design technique. I'm using this texture and color with this texture and color. Get them, I don't put them right next to each other. I put them in the same section. You, so you look down from the deck of the patio, it's going, wow, that's pretty. Um, junipers do great here. All junipers do great. And I think junipers get a bad rap because of allergies. If you've got juniper allergies, this is not the culprit. This has been sterilized. It doesn't even put on pollen. It's the big native junipers, those bad boys. They're the one, and if you've got allergies, there's nothing you can do. You're surrounded by a forest. And when they start to throw up pollen, it looks like it, the tree is on fire, literally. There's that much pollen. Um, so this guy I'll pop underneath just to have some bright spots. And they're just tough. You can't kill these. They're slow, methodical growers. This one gets up about this high and just spreads out, kind of does this thing. Perfect low maintenance plan. With that, and that, that can come in blue, silver, green. It comes in any color you want. I just like the gold, so I brought that one. This is feeling blue Deodor cedar. It's related to the monster, that huge evergreen that grows up to like 60 feet tall and 30 feet wide, huge swimming Deodor cedar, related to that. Only this one does not take over. This one is great for uh, rock walls, hillsides, a container. I use this one by my pond, just to soften, you know, water's great, I'm gonna soften it up so it looks, it looks, Gordy, I didn't want a high maintenance thing. I don't want someone got to mow and nurture and care for. You must grow on your own and thrive, or I will pull you out or let you die. What's That's the just the way I am. I want low care. What's the name again? This is this is feeling blue, Deodor cedar. What this one does, it grows up about three feet, and then just starts flowing. It spills. It flows over in between the rocks. Uh, kind of goes down towards the edge of the pond and softens it up. Just pulls on the back side. Uh, softens up rock, rock lawns. It's be great next to a rock lawn. It'll take that heat, reflective heat. It's an evergreen, drought hardy. It's a great little plant, uh, but super unusual. You don't see it just anywhere. You're probably only going to find this at one place in the county. Guess where it would be? Waters Garden Center. You got it. And then the last lesson. I'm going to go over this one. And this is not a native. Well, we got to cover this because it's so confusing to folks. This is an azalea. I would say the same thing with rhododendrons, Igelia, columbines. There's a lot of different shade-loving plants that thrive here. This is not a low-water plant, but remember, it's in the shade. Shade plants don't need a lot of water because they're never sun scalded. They don't get burnt out. The soil doesn't get vaporized. It's in the shade. And so I think you can have some really sexy, beautiful, just, I mean, look at this. You just want to take a picture of it, put it on your Instagram post. I mean, it's beautiful. 
and it only gets bigger and better and, more, and, and brighter as it matures. And so I'm seeing a lot of uh, rhododendrons up in Paisley Homestead, that White Spars area. You see them in the forest. And they're beautiful. Animals don't eat these, they're evergreen, they get this fluorescent color. I think you can have your cake and eat it too. Really out in the sunlight, you really gotta be strategic if you wanna have it go low care, low water. That's gonna be the things we've just been talking about. The lesson here is in the shade, the plants, you can go with less water efficient plants because they don't need as much water because they don't dry out as often. Does it make sense? I can pick it then? Okay. And then two flowers, which two flowers? Let's go to this one, I love this one. And this one, we'll go to these two. Well, we'll go three. I use all three of these in my gardens. This is penstemon. Penstemon grows wild. Um, this is one the hummingbirds use often because they're, they're coming up, they're, they're migrating now. And they'll see this, they'll use this as a food source as they're going north. It's a perennial, it's back every year. This is really tall. It only gets up about that tall and gets bushier. Comes in pink, red, whites, a variety of color, but penstemon. You see that, uh, you know it's going to be good for here. Great perennial that will come back every year. A companion plant to that, which I like even more, is Centranthus, or Jupiter's beard, is the common name. This one's an evergreen. Um, it start, mine looks exactly like this in the yard. Starting to have these globes or, or yet red. Uh, Tops, flowers on the top. It's got a very waxy, almost like a, almost like a sedum type of or euphorbia type of foliage. It holds a lot of moisture within the structure of the plant. But this one I plant uphill and it reseeds and acts like a wildflower. It just kind of comes up in other portions. You've got that uh, uh, driveway and that rock wall going on the other side. You need something to kind of hold in the rocks over there, kind of soften it up. This would be a great one because it'll recede and spill over and just grow in, in easy care. Hummingbirds love this. But uh, butterflies are all, all over Centranthus. And lastly, and then I'll leave it. This one, I've got javelina in my front yard. The backyard's fenced, so all I have to worry about are, are the small things, voles and pack rats, that kind of stuff, squirrels. The front yard, it's a free-for-all. Everything can grow in there. Mainly it's javelina or my nemesis. Uh, I've got raised beds, patios, it's pretty out there. You just want to watch the sunset. It's very, very nice. Um, this one, I need something by the mailbox. It's kind of sterile. It's right out there by the end of the driveway. But I didn't want to run a lot of irrigation out there. I want something that's just on the edge of all my gardens. So I need something that was really tough, that was, that was a rock star. It was beautiful most of the year. And I went with this. This is called Gara. G-A-U-R-A. -A, Gara. It gets up about... Well, the foliage only gets up as tall as this, maybe a foot tall. But the little flowers hover above the foliage about two to three feet tall. It'll get up about that high, okay, just above knee high. And it just does this all season. I mean, from April through November, it does this. It's amazing how tough this plant is. And the only irrigation it gets is, I don't know how it, I don't know how it thrives. It just does, it's on its own by the mailbox. Reflective heat, it's right there with the asphalt, the driveway, just does this. And I noticed that hummingbirds will be running across the yard, you know, at like light speed. Zoom. They'll see this thing in bloom and go, whoa, whoa, they come right back for it. It's like a it's like a game stopper for for for, for hummingbirds. They love this plant called Gara. A good old perennial, drought hardy, native, I call it kind of a western native. It just grows and naturalizes so easily. And again, you'll probably never have just one. My intent has planted one out there, and now I've got three. It just kind of came up next to each other, kind of this little triangular pattern that, that grows. Comes in white, apple blossom, and a bright pink. There's three different flavors down the lower greenhouse. Okay? So the way the nursery is laid out, our perennials, those are plants that come back every year. Flowers, typically. The perennial flowers in that lower greenhouse. This house up here, this is our annual house. They live for a year and then they die. So annuals are bright color. But they're the ones that can get so many flowers, you can't even see the foliage. There are that many flowers. That's an annual for you. Vegetables are an annual typically. And all of our herbs are up in this house. In between here, this is all of our bright, sunny, 
shrubs. Um, this is where most of these things came from is out here in the sun. Again, this is a hot area. It's in between the two buildings. It gets, it's, it's hot. And then the shady things is uh, to the left of the greenhouse over there, up against the wall, the, uh, the road in there, that's gonna be your azaleas, rhododendrons, wydelias, hollies, those things that need the shade. And right now we don't have the shade structure pulled over, but as it gets, as it gets up to mid 80s, we'll start to pull the shades so if they're more protected. So that's kind of how the layout is. And of course, trees and evergreens. If you're into privacy, the junipers, Arizona cypress, Italian cypress, spruce, pine, firs, those are all going to be over here because there's a theme going on right now. A number of times I hear, I hear, I've been fine for the last 10 years, but now my neighbor is building a house and I want to block them. I want a living screen. So that seems to be a thing right now. And so we set up a whole section, nothing but screening plants. That'll be on that side. Okay, just so you know, I'll hang out here. But before you go, I'll let you clap for me just because the old actor in me just has to help. So thank you all. And I'll hang out with questions. We'll be here for you if you need something.